in-depth study of, um, of the chemical bond. So we are going to talk uh, we're going to talk about ionic um, and covalent in these next two chapters and um, our understanding of these things are going to broaden. <clears throat> Bear with it. And if the projector goes out mid mid lecture, mid lesson, I guess I'm going to have to go to the board. All right, you guys. So um, we we talked about the chemical bond the second day of school, and the reason that we talked about um, different kinds of bonds is because we needed to be able to name compounds and different compounds are named um, or compounds are named depending on the nature of their bond. We have different rules for naming ionic compounds than we do for naming covalent compounds. And so we did a very brief overview at that time about chemical bonds, uh, but now it's time to really strengthen our understanding of the nature of these bonds. All right, now the first thing we need to keep in mind is here, a chemical bond can be viewed as forces that cause a group of atoms to behave as a unit. Okay, and the message in this is that as soon as atoms bond up with other atoms, whether that force of attraction is sharing elect valence electrons or transferring of valence electrons, um, that what they form as the compound is now its own unique entity independent, well not completely independent, but not the same as the atoms that make it up. Compounds now have their own unique properties that are different from the properties of the atoms on their own. <clears throat> and a bond is most definitely, you guys, a force of attraction. Okay, it's, it's all about the force of valence electrons between neighboring atoms. Okay. Um, bonds occur when collections of atoms are more stable, lower in energy than the separate atoms on their own. And what we find in nature is that atoms really don't exist on their own. There's very, very few examples uh, in nature of a single atom hanging out by itself. Uh, I read in an old textbook uh, a couple of examples of those, of course, are noble gases. One being helium, which uh, we find on its own, a single helium atom in stores of natural gases, CH4, methane. Uh, so single helium, that's kind of abundant in natural gas sources, and argon, single atoms of argon in our atmosphere. Um, it's relatively abundant in our atmosphere, relatively abundant, okay, not real abundant, but uh, as constituents go. So those are really the only examples, and, and you know, there's rare examples of other neon, of other noble gases being on their own. But otherwise, you guys, atoms are bonded either to themselves, like the Magnificent Seven hydrogen gas H two, one hydrogen bound to another hydrogen, the other Magnificent Seven, or in compounds, even pure elements, for instance, like pure carbon, does that, is that just a single carbon hanging out on its own? Well, no. If we're going to find different allotropes or different forms of pure carbon on Earth, they're going to be diamond, which are many atoms of carbon together, or uh, fullerenes, many atoms of carbon together. 
or graphite, many atoms of carbon. We just did a stoichiometry problem with, uh, in our review, with sulfur, S8. When sulfur, that's the yellow, the yellow typical form of sulfur we find in the Earth's crust, is in the form of S8. Okay, because they are more stable when they are bound. The most important requirement for the formation of a stable compound is that all the atoms involved achieve a noble gas configuration. Okay, so that is eight in their valence. And if you'd like to talk to a quantum physicist about why eight electrons in their valence in the natural world is stable, please do. Um, but it's all about energy, you know, and that is the lowest possible energy state. Everything is at its lowest possible energy state if the valence shell is Okay. Um, now, we're going to find you guys that really uh, bonding is on a continuum. We can classify compounds into, or we can classify bonds, the force of attraction that holds one atom to another. Um, we can put those into three categories, ionic, covalent, and metallic. Now we can further subdivide these, and, you know, we can talk about a covalent network, etc., which we will a little bit in class. Um, but in general, you guys, we fit everything into these three, into these three categories, depending upon uh, the nature of the attraction. There's a little story. In a metallic bond, where we have the most generous sharing. Electrons are shared valence, 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 okay? So we've got to keep in mind, you guys, we're never talking about core electrons here. When we're talking about bonding, we are talking about valence electrons. We know that core electrons are being held very tightly by the nuclear charge. Very, very tightly. They do not get ripped away. Lots of energy is not even worth it. Okay, so in a metallic bond, valence electrons are shared by being passed from passed on from metal atom to metal atom. The valence electrons from metals are free to wander. Um, and we think of the nuclei of the metal atoms and the core electrons as being surrounded by a sea of valence electrons. They are just free to flow from one, one atom to another atom to another atom to another atom. And this is what gives metals, pure metals, their characteristics of, for instance, electrical conductivity, because those valence electrons are just able to flow, as well as their shining luster. And I'm still not exactly certain, like, what does that mean? Why do the flowing valence electrons impart to metals that they're shining this. Maybe you can find that out and tell me. Okay. Um, so, metallic bonds, the, the most sharing of all. Um, in an ionic bond, I really should have gone in order from most sharing to least sharing, but I didn't. I went from most sharing to most stingy. Um, with our in-between last. Okay, in an ionic bond, valence electrons are transferred from a metal atom to a non-metal atom, forming oppositely charged ions. And opposite charges trap. So when we put, for instance, sodium metal in chlorine gas, what will end up happening is that the, the chlorine, the non-metal, is going to rip away the electrons the valence, well, not electrons, the valence electron from the sodium atom, and now chlorine becomes chloride with eight valence electrons, and sodium becomes sodium ion, and now it also has eight valence electrons. 
Um, and because sodium is positively charged, chloride is negative, those opposite charges attract. Also, you guys, when we have ions dissolved in solution, and the solvent is removed either by evaporation, and generally I'm talking about water here, so that those oppositely charged ions now, um, their proximity gets closer and closer. At a certain point, when the positively charged ion and the negatively charged ion are close enough and there's no solvent molecules keeping them apart, they will actually attract up, right? Bond up and stick together and form a solid matrix of um, ionic compound. Okay, so this is from oppositely charged ions attracting. Okay, and last but not least, we've got, and we will see you guys, we've got all, we've got differing degrees of this. In a covalent bond, pairs of valence electrons are shared between atoms of non-metals. Okay, and what we are going to be able to talk about now that we weren't able to talk about the second day of school, of course, is um, atomic structure. We know how tightly particular nuclei hold on to their valence electrons, and that's what's going to explain why is it that nonmetals share electrons, they don't give them up. Well, they've got great effective nuclear charge, they're not going to give up their valence electrons. And so, one, one nucleus cannot overpower the other nucleus, and so what ends up happening is that they share electrons. Whereas, that's not the case with the metals. Those valence electrons are held very loosely, and the nonmetals are able to just take them away, right? They can't share because the metallic nucleus doesn't have the ability to attract any valence electrons to it. It can't even hold on to its own. So, now, you guys, we can start talking about this in terms of atomic structure. Okay, but we can still go back to this idea of which compounds have which bonds, we, we can still pretty much use what we learned the second day of school, these general guidelines, and that is that metallic bonds occur between a metal and a metal. Okay, none of those nuclei have charge enough to hold on to their valence electrons, so they just go from one metal atom to another. Uh, ionic bonds are always between metals and non-metals. You know, because the metals can't hold on and the non-metals have a, they've got real good effective nuclear charge, right? They can just rip them away <clears throat> because of their atomic structure. And last but not least, I think that's it, covalent between non-metals and non-metals. Okay, neither nuclei can overpower the other in terms of pulling away for good valence electrons, and so they share. All right, we'll talk about this in class tomorrow and um, do a couple problems about this, about um, valence electrons and bonding, and then we're going to talk about these things more in depth.